Chapter 19 of The Report on Unidentified Flying Objects. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Roger Moline. The Report on Unidentified Flying Objects by Edward Ruppelt. Chapter 19 Off They Go Into the Wild Blue Yonder. At 12.30 p.m. on Thursday, November 20th, 1952, history was made. At least, so says George Adamski, lecturer on philosophy and student of technical matters and astronomy. At 12.30 p.m. on Thursday, November 20th, 1952, George Adamski was the first man on earth to talk to a Venusian. At least, so says George Adamski. I was chief of Project Blue Book at the time, and the name Professor Adamski, he had a title then, wasn't new to me. He or some of his followers had been showering the Air Force with photos of flying saucers. Letters by the gross were coming in demanding recognition of the great professor and an analysis of his photos. We obliged, and the photos were examined by the experts at Wright-Patterson Photo Reconnaissance Labs. The verdict came back, They could be genuine, of course, but they also could have been easily faked by a ten-year-old with a brownie camera. For a few weeks we forgot George Adamski, but then the press began to clamor at our gates. The news was leaking out of Southern California. George Adamski had talked to a Venusian. We held out for a long time, but the pressure mounted, and I headed for California to find out what it was all about. As far as George Adamski was concerned, I was just another thirsty sightseer from the famous observatory on Mount Palomar when I walked into the little restaurant at the foot of this famous mountain one day in 1953. The four-stool restaurant, with a few tables, where Adamski worked as a handyman, was crowded when I arrived, and he was circulating around, serving beer and picking up empty bottles. There was no doubt as to who he was, because his fame had spread. To the dozen almost reverently spoken queries, Are you Adamski? he modestly nodded his head. Small questions about the flying saucer photos for sale from convenient racks led to more questions, and before long the good professor had taken a position in the middle of the room and was off and running. In his slightly broken English he told how he was the son of poor Polish immigrants with hardly any formal education. To look at the man and to listen to his story you had an immediate urge to believe him. Maybe it was his appearance. He was dressed in well-worn but neat overalls. He had slightly graying hair and the most honest pair of eyes I've ever seen. Or maybe it was the way he told his story. He spoke softly and naively, almost pathetically, giving the impression that most people think I'm crazy, but honestly, I'm really not. Adamski started his story by telling how he had spent many long and cold nights at his telescope at the request of the government trying to photograph one of the flying saucers everyone had been talking about. He'd been successful, as the full photograph racks on the wall showed, and he thought the next step would be to actually try to contact a saucer. For some reason, Adamski didn't know exactly why, on November 19th, he'd decided to go out into the Mojave Desert. He'd called some friends and told them to meet him there. By noon the next day, the party, which consisted of Adamski and six others, had met and were eating lunch near the town of Desert Center on the California-Arizona border. They looked for saucers, but except for an occasional airplane, the cloudless blue sky was empty. They were about ready to give it up as a bad day when another airplane came over. Again they looked up, but this time, in addition to seeing the airplane, 
they saw a silvery, cigar-shaped flying saucer. For some reason, again he didn't know why, the group of people moved down the road where Adamski left them and took off into the desert alone. By this time the spaceship had disappeared and once again Adamski was about to give up. Then a flash of light caught his eye and a smaller saucer, he later learned it was a scout ship, came drifting down and landed about a half mile from him. He swung his camera into action and started to take pictures. Unfortunately, the one picture Adamski had to show was so out of focus the scout ship looked like a desert rock. He took a few more pictures, he told his audience, and had stopped to admire the little scout ship when he suddenly noticed a man standing nearby. Now even those in the crowded restaurant who had been smirking when he started his story had put down their beers and were listening. This is what they had come to hear. You could actually have heard the proverbial pin drop. Adamski told what went through his mind when he first saw the man, maybe a prospector. But he noticed the man's long, shoulder-length, sandy-colored hair, his dark skin, his oriental features, and his ski-pant-type trousers. He was puzzled. Then it came to his mind like a flash. He was looking at a person from some other world. Through mental pictures, sign language, and a few words of English, Adamski found out the man was from Venus. He was friendly, and that they, the Venusians, were worried about radiation from our atomic bombs. They talked. George pointed to his camera, but the man from Venus politely refused to be photographed. Adamski pleaded to go into the ship to see how it operated, but the Venusian refused this, too. They talked some more, of spaceships and of solar systems, before Adamski walked with his newfound friend to the saucer and saw the Venusian off into space. At this point, Adamski recalled how he had glanced up in the sky to see the air full of military aircraft. Needless to say, the rest of Adamski's party, who had supposedly seen the contact from a mile away, were excited. They rushed up to him, and it was then that they noticed the footprints. Plainly imprinted in the desert sand were curious markings made by ridges on the soles of the Venusian's shoes. At the urging of the crowd in the restaurant, Adamski took an old shoe box out from under the counter. One of his party, that day, had just happened to have some plaster of Paris, and the shoe box contained plaster casts of shoe prints with strange, hieroglyphic-like symbols on the soles. No one in the restaurant asked how the weight of a mere man could make such sharp imprints in the dry, coarse desert sand. Next he showed the sworn statements of the witnesses, and the crowd moved in around him for a better look. As I left he was graciously filling people in on more details, and the cash register was merrily ringing up saucer picture sales. I didn't write the trip off as a complete loss. The weather in California was beautiful. Adamski held the UFO spotlight for some time. The Venusians paid him another visit, this time at the restaurant, and he photographed their ship. This, whether by Venusian fate or design, increased the flow of traffic to the restaurant at the base of Mount Palomar. It also had its side effects. An astronomer from the observatory that houses the world-famous 200-inch telescope on top of Mount Palomar told me, I hate to admit it, but the number of weekend visitors has picked up here. People drive down to hear George and decide that since they're down here, they might as well come up and see our establishment. But George Adamski didn't hold the front center of the stage for long. In rapid succession, others stepped forward and hesitantly admitted that they too had been contacted. 
Truman Bethurum, a journeyman mechanic of Redondo Beach, California, was next up. Actually, he admitted, he had been the first Earthman to talk to a person from another world. Back on the night of July 26, 1952, four months before Adamski, a group of eight or ten short, olive-skinned men with black wavy hair had awakened him while he was asleep in a truck in the desert near Mormon Flats, Nevada. These little men, unlike Adamski's, spoke any language. "'You name it,' they'd quipped to Bethurum. "'We speak it.' In a newspaper article that was voted Best Read of 1953, Bethurum told how the little man he met had been more cooperative and had actually taken him into their saucer, a huge job, 300 feet in diameter and 16 feet high. Once inside, Bethurum had met the captain of the scow, a true leader of men. Aura Rains was her name, and she was a Venus de Milo with arms and warm blood. When she spoke, her words rhymed. They chatted, and Bethurum learned that he was on the Admiral's scow, the command ship of Clarion's fleet of saucers. All in all, Bethurum made eleven visits to Aura's scow. Each time, they'd sit and talk. Bethram told her about the Earth, and she told of the idyllic Shangri-La-type planet of Clarion, a yet undiscovered planet which is always opposite the moon. But before too long, both Truman Bethram and George Adamski had to move over. Daniel Fry, an engineer, stepped in. At a press conference to kick off the International Saucer Convention in Los Angeles, Fry told how he had not only contacted the spacemen two years before Adamski and Bethurum, he had actually ridden in a flying saucer. It had all started on the night of July 4, 1950, when Engineer Fry was temporarily employed at White Sands Proving Ground in New Mexico. It was a hot night, and with nothing else to do, Fry decided to take a walk across the desert. He hadn't traveled far when he saw a bluish light hovering over the mountains, which rimmed this famous proving ground. He paid no attention. He'd heard flying saucer stories before, and just plain didn't believe them. But as he watched, the light came closer and closer and closer, until a weird craft came silently to rest on the desert floor, not seventy feet away. For seconds, Fry, who had seen missile-age developments at White Sands that would have dumbfounded most laymen, merely stood and stared. The object, Fry told newsmen, was an ovate spheroid about thirty feet at the equator, Fry has a habit of drifting off into the technical. Its outside surface was a highly polished silver with a slight violet iridescent glow. At first Fry wanted to run, but his rigid technical training overrode his common natural urges. He decided to go over to the object and see what made it tick. He circled it several times and nothing broke the desert silence. Then he touched it. "'Better not touch that hull, pal. It's hot,' boomed a voice in a Hollywoodian tone. Fry recoiled. The voice softened and added, "'Take it easy, pal. You're among friends.' After politely reading off the spaceman, or whoever he was, for scaring him, Pal Fry and the voice settled down for a friendly moonlight chat. Fry learned that the voice was indeed that of a spaceman, and they were down to pick up a new supply of air. After about four years of earth air transfusions, according to the spaceman, they would become adapted to our atmosphere and our gravity and become immunized to your biotics. The craft, Fry was told, 
was a cargo carrier, unmanned and built to zoom down and scoop up earth air. The conversation went on, waxing technical at times, and ended with an invitation to look into the ship. Then the spaceman, possibly carried away by all the interest Fry was showing, offered a ride. Fry accepted, and they anti-demagnetized off for New York City. Thirty minutes later they were back at White Sands. Over New York City they came down from thirty-five to twenty miles, and Fry could read the marquee of the Fulton Theater. The seven-year itch was playing. He hadn't told the Air Force about his ride before because he was afraid he'd lose his job. But at the press conference he did plug his new book, The White Sands Incident. By this time Adansky had already published his book, Flying Saucers Have Landed, and it looked as if Fry was going to cut him out. But Fry took a lie detector test on a widely viewed West Coast television show and flunked it flat. His stock dropped as fast as it had risen, but the decline was somewhat checked when a well-known Southern California medium wrote to her old friend J. Edgar Hoover about the situation. Hoover, the story goes, shot back an answer. Lie detectors are no good. But the damage had been done. The rigged lie detector test had unfortunately relegated Daniel Fry, engineer, missile expert, part owner of an engineering plant, and interplanetary hitchhiker to the Bush League. With Adamski and Bethurum on the stage and Fry peeking out of the wings, all hell broke loose. One could say that everyone tried to get into the act but I'd rather think that each colony of space people tried to promote their own candidate. In England, one Cedric Allingham met a Martian on the Moors. In France, Germany, the United States, Portugal, Brazil, Spain, everywhere, people too uneducated to pull a hoax met green men, dark men, white men, big men with little heads, little men with big heads, and men with pointed heads. They wore motorcycle belts, baggy pants, diver suits, and were naked. One lady proudly announced that a Venusian had tried to seduce her, and within days another snorted in disgust. A Martian had seduced her. Then Adamski took a hop through outer space and back. Saucers poured forth words of wisdom via radio, light beams, and mental telepathy. All of these messages were duly recorded on tape, and sales were hot at $4.50 per ten-minute tape. Not to be outdone by any other lousy planet, the Venusians picked up a young man from Los Angeles and actually took him to Venus. Not once, but three times. He packed in audiences by telling how he had been contacted one night and asked by a strange man if he would go on an important mission. Afraid, but not one to shirk his patriotic duties, he met the stranger at a prearranged spot and was whisked off to Venus. During a high-level conference up there, he was given the word, Tell the Earthlings to lay off their atomic weapons, or else... They're killing all our doves, and we make our flying saucers out of the feathers our live doves shed. The Venusians, this space traveler warned his audiences, were already infiltrating the Earth, and he intimated that they were ready to move in case we didn't cease atomic testing. His next two trips to Venus were purely social. The highlight of his lecture, when he awes his audience, is when he whips out his proof. One, a blood smear on a slide, genuine Venusian blood. Two, an affidavit from his landlady stating he wasn't home on three occasions, and three, 
a photo of a Venusian walking in Los Angeles's MacArthur Park. The mere fact that the Venusian looks like any Joe Dokes walking down the street is a picayunish point. Venusians look just like us. And it hasn't stopped. During the big UFO flap of 1957, a man stumbled into a landing saucer and chatted a while with its occupants. A few months later, soon after the atomic-powered USS Nautilus made its historic trip under the polar ice cap, this same man snorted in disgust. He packed his suitcase and started on a lecture tour. Months before, he'd been there in a flying saucer. Once again, people shelled out hard cash to hear his story. Wherever you are, Mr. P.T. Barnum, you are undoubtedly grinning from ear to ear. But there is a sober side to this apparently comical picture. The common undertone to many of these stories, hot from the lips of a spaceman, is utopia. On these other worlds there is no illness, and they've learned how to cure all diseases. There are no wars, they've learned how to live peaceably, there is no poverty, everyone has everything he wants. There is no old age. They've learned the secret of eternal life. Too many times this subtle pitch can be boiled down to, step right up, folks, and put a donation in the pot. I'm just on the verge of learning the spaceman's secrets, and with a little money to carry out my work, I'll give you the secret. I've seen a man, crippled by arthritis, hobbling out into the desert in hopes that his friend who talks to the Martians could get them to cure him on their next trip. I've seen pensioners, who needed every buck they had, shell out money to help buy radio equipment, to contact some planet to find out how they'd solve their economic problems. I saw a little old lady in a many times mended dress put down a ten-dollar bill to help promote a peace campaign backed by the Venusians. She'd lost two sons in the war, but had four grandsons she wanted to keep alive. A couple died and left $15,000 to a man to build a longevity machine so others could live. The Martians had given him the plans. A woman died of thirst and exposure in the Mojave Desert, trying to reach the spot where a man told her he was going to make a contact. Some of it isn't comical. Even though the field is becoming crowded, through thick and thin, Martian and Venusian, the old maestro, George Adamski, is still head and shoulders above the rest. The hamburger stand is boarded up, and he lives in a big ranch house. He vacations in Mexico, and has his own clerical staff. His two books, Flying Saucers Have Landed, and Inside the Spaceships, have sold something in the order of 200,000 copies, and have been translated into nearly every language except Russian. To date, he's had 11 visits from people from Mars, Venus, and Saturn. Evidently, Truman Bethurum's Aura Reigns put out the word about Earthmen because two beautiful space women have now entered Adamski's life. An incredibly lovely blonde named Kalna and the equally beautiful Ilmuth. Only a few months ago, while on one of his numerous nationwide lecture tours, a saucer unexpectedly picked Adamski up in Kansas City and took him on a galactic cruise before depositing him at Fort Madison, Iowa, where he had a lecture date. He wowed the packed auditorium with his proof, an unused Kansas City to Fort Madison train ticket. Last week in the Netherlands, Adamski's nationwide tours have expanded to worldwide tours, he repeated his exploits to Queen Juliana. But at Buckingham Palace, Mr. Barnum, all he saw was the changing of the guard. End of chapter 19
Recording by Roger Moline. Chapter 20 of The Report on Unidentified Flying Objects. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Roger Moline. The Report on Unidentified Flying Objects by Edward Ruppelt. Chapter 20 Do They or Don't They? During the past four years, the most frequent question I've been asked is What do you personally think? Do unidentified flying objects exist, or don't they? I'm positive they don't. I was very skeptical when I finished my tour of active duty with the Air Force and left Project Blue Book in 1953, but now I'm convinced. Since I left the Air Force, the age of the satellite has arrived, and we're in it. Along with this new era came the long-range radars, the satellite tracking cameras, and the other instruments that would have picked up any type of spaceship coming into our atmosphere. None of this instrumentation has ever given any indication of any type of unknown vehicle entering the Earth's atmosphere. I checked this with the Department of Defense, and I checked this through friends associated with tracking projects. In both cases, the results were completely negative. There's not even a glimmer of hope for the UFO. Then there's Project Moonwatch, the optical satellite tracking program for the International Geophysical Year. Dr. J. Allen Hynek, the director of Moonwatch, wrote to me, I can quite safely say that we have no record of ever having received from our Moonwatch teams any reports of sightings of unidentified objects which had any characteristics different from those of an orbiting satellite, a slow meteor, or of a suspected plane mistaken for a satellite. Dr. Hynek should know. He has investigated and analyzed more UFO reports than any other scientist in the world. And the third convincing point is that 12 years have passed since the first UFO report was made and still there is not one shred of material evidence of anything unknown and no photos of anything other than meaningless blobs of light. The next question that always arises is, but people are seeing something. Experienced observers like pilots, scientists, and radar operators have reported UFOs. To be very frank, we heard the words experienced observer so many times these words soon began to make us ill. Everyone, except housewives with myopia, were experienced observers. Pilots, scientists, a term used equally as loosely, engineers, radar operators, everyone who reported a UFO was some kind of an experienced observer. This man had taught aircraft recognition during World War II. He was an experienced observer. That man spent four years in the Air Force. He was an experienced observer. We soon learned that everyone is an experienced observer as long as what he sees is familiar to him. As soon as he sees something unfamiliar, it's a UFO. Pilots probably come as close to falling into this category as anyone since they do spend a lot of time looking around the sky but even those who can rattle off the names and locations of stars, planets, and constellations don't know about a few relatively rare astronomical phenomena. The bolide, or supermeteor, is a good example. Few pilots have ever, or will ever, see a deluxe model bolide, but when they do, they'll never forget it. It's like something shooting a flare in front of your face. There are a number of reports of bolides in the Blue Book files, and each pilot who made each report called each bolide a UFO. The descriptions are almost identical to the classic descriptions of bolides found in astronomy books. While on the subject of meteors, if most people realized that meteors can have a flat trajectory, they can go from horizon to horizon, they can travel in formation or groups, and they can be seen in daylight as large silver disks, 
the work of UFO investigators would be lighter. Enough of meteors, and back to our experienced observers. The example of pilots and bolides holds true in many, many other cases. Take high-flying jets, for example. To a person in an area where there isn't much high-altitude air traffic, a thin, blood-red streak in the sky at sunset, or shortly after, is a UFO. To anyone in an area where there are a lot of high-flying jets, even our myopic housewife, it's just another vapor trail. They're as common as the sunset. When the flashing red strobe lights, now used on practically all aircraft, were still in the experimental stage back in 1951, they gave us fits. Every time an airplane with one of these flashing lights made a flight, people within miles, including other pilots, called in UFO reports. Now these strobe lights are common, and no one even bothers to look up. The same held true, and still does, for the odd array of lights used on tanker planes during aerial refueling operations. Some phenomena are so rare and so little is known about them that they are always UFOs. The most common is the disk following the airplane. I've never heard an explanation for this phenomenon, but it exists, and I've seen it on three occasions. Maybe a dense blob of air tears off the airplane, floats along behind, and reflects the sunlight. Whatever it is, it gives the illusion of a saucer chasing an airplane. Sometimes it's steady, and sometimes it darts back and forth. It only stays in view a few seconds, and when it disappears, it fades and looks for all the world as if it's suddenly streaking away into the distance. Birds, bees, bugs, airplanes, planets, stars, balloons, and a host of other common everyday objects become UFOs the instant they are viewed under other than normal situations. Then there is radar. This poor inanimate piece of electronic equipment has taken a beating when UFO proof is being offered. Radar is not subject to the frailties of the human mind, is the outcry of every saucer fan, and radar has seen UFOs. Radar is no better than the radar observer, and the radar observer has a mind. And where there's a mind, there is the same old trouble. If the presentation on the radar scope doesn't look like it has looked for years, a UFO is being tracked. Radar is temperamental. The scope presentation of each radar has certain peculiarities, and an operator gets used to seeing these. Occasionally, and for some unknown reason, these peculiarities suddenly change. For months, a temperature inversion may cause 50 or 75 targets to appear on the radar scope. The operator has learned to recognize them and knows that they are caused by weather. They are not UFOs. But overnight something changes, and now this same temperature inversion causes only one or two targets. The operator isn't used to seeing this, and the targets are now UFOs. Many times we'd stumble across the fact that after the first report of a UFO being tracked on radar, the same identical type of target would be tracked again many times. But by this time, the operator would have learned that they were caused by weather and it wouldn't be reported to us. It is interesting to note that, to my knowledge, there has never been a radar sighting classed as unknown when radar scope photos were taken. The reason is simple. The radar operator can take ample time to re-examine what he had to interpret in seconds during the actual sighting. Also, more experienced radar operators have a chance to examine the scope presentation. Mixed in with the fact that there are few really qualified observers on this earth is the power of suggestion. About the time someone yells, UFO, and points, all powers of reasoning come to a screeching halt. We saw this happen day after day. 
Few people I ever talked to, once they had decided they were looking at a UFO, stopped to calmly say to themselves, Now, couldn't this be a balloon, star, planet, or something else explainable? In one instance, I traveled halfway across the United States to investigate a report made by a high-ranking man in the State Department, an experienced observer. It was evening by the time I got to talk to him, and after he'd excitedly told me all the pertinent facts, how this bright fight had jumped across the sky, he said, "'Want to see it? It's still there, but it's not jumping now.' We went outside, and there was Jupiter." Then there was the UFO over Dayton, Ohio, in the summer of 1952. I first heard about it at home. It was about six in the evening when the phone rang, and it was one of the tower operators at Patterson Field. The tower operators at Lockbourne Air Force Base in Columbus, Ohio, 60 miles east of Dayton, had spotted three fiery spheres flying in a V formation over their base. Two F-84s had been scrambled to intercept, and they were in the air right now. So far, the tower operator told me, the intercept had been unsuccessful because the objects were traveling two to three thousand miles an hour and were too high for the old F-84s. He was monitoring the two jets' radio conversation, and he puts his telephone near the speaker. I heard... At 28,000 and still above us. High speed. Headed toward Wright Patterson. Low on fuel. Going home. I made it to my car in record time and took off toward Wright Patterson, about 12 miles from where I was living. It was still light, although the sun was low, and as I drove I kept looking toward the east. Nothing. I reached the gate, showed my pass to the guard, and had just written the whole thing off as another UFO report when I saw them. They convinced me. Off to the east of the airbase were three objects that can best be described as three half-sized suns. By the time I arrived at base operations, there were three or four dozen people on the ramp, all looking up. The standard comment was, Look at them go! About this time, a C-54 transport taxied up and stopped. It was the Kitty Hawk flight from Washington, and I knew several people who got off. One passenger, an officer from ATIC, ran up to me and handed me a roll of film. Here's some pictures of them, he said breathlessly. I never thought I'd see one. The next passengers I recognized were two other officers, Ph.D. psychologists from the Aeromedical Laboratory. I knew them because they had visited Blue Book many times, collecting data for a paper they were writing on UFOs. The title of the paper was to be The Psychological Aspects of UFO Sightings. Almost climbing over each other in their effort to tell their story, they told me how they had watched the UFOs from the C-54. Both had seen them dogfighting between themselves. "'How fast were they going?' I asked. "'Like hell!' was their only answer, but the way they said it and the looks on their faces emphasized their statement. The crowd on the ramp had increased by now, and some of the newcomers had binoculars. The men with the binoculars were the focal point of several individual groups as they watched and gave blow-by-blow -blow accounts. Some of the crowd were talking about jet fighters, and it suddenly dawned on me that just across the parking lot was the operations office of the local ADC jet outfit, the 97th Fighter Interceptor Squadron. I ran over to Interceptor Operations and went in. I knew the duty officer because several times before the 97th people had chased balloons over Dayton. When I told him about the UFOs, all I received was a rather uninterested stare. When I said they were over the base, he did me the courtesy of going out to look. 
he came running back in and hit the scramble button. Three minutes later, two F-86s were heading UFO-ward. They soon disappeared, but their vapor trails kept the tense crowd informed of their progress. And believe me, there was tension. As the vapor trail spiraled up, first as two distinct plumes, and later only one, as they blended at altitude, more than one pilot standing on the ramp expressed his thankfulness for his unenviable position, on the ground, watching. The vapor trails thinned out and disappeared right under the three UFOs, and it was obvious that the two jets had closed in. Here were three that didn't escape. That night, the 97th Fighter Interceptor Squadron added three more balloons to their record, the F-86s had been able to climb higher than the F-84s. The next morning, photos confirmed the balloons. They had been tethered together and carried an instrument package. I had been fooled. Two Ph.D. psychologists who had studied UFOs had been fooled. A C-54 load of experienced observers, many pilots, had been fooled. The tower operators had been fooled, and so had a hundred others. This was an interesting sighting, and we used to discuss it a lot. All of the observers later agreed that what made them so excited was the tower operator's announcement, F-84s from Lockbourne are chasing three high-speed objects. This set the stage, and from then on no one even considered the fact that if the objects had been traveling 2,000 or 3,000 miles an hour, they would have been long gone in the 15 minutes we watched them. Secondly, I found out that the C-54, a slow airplane, had actually overtaken and passed the balloons between Columbus and Dayton, but none of the passengers I talked to had stopped to think of this. And I'm positive that in our minds the balloons which were about 40 feet in diameter and at 40,000 feet, looked a lot larger than they actually were. I know the power of suggestion plays an important role in UFO sightings. Once you're convinced you're looking at a UFO, you can see a lot of things. But then there's the unknowns. Any good saucer fan, wild-eyed or sober, will magnanimously concede that a certain percentage of the UFO sightings are the misidentification of known objects. They drag out the unknowns as the proof. Technically speaking, an unknown report is one that has been made by a reliable observer, not necessarily experienced. The report has been exhaustively investigated and analyzed, and there is no logical explanation. To this, the Air Force says, the Air Force emphasizes the belief that if more immediate detailed objective observational data could have been obtained on the unknowns, these too could have been satisfactorily explained. I think the case of the Lubbock Lights is an excellent example of this. It is probably one of the most thoroughly investigated reports in the UFO files, and it contained the most precise observational data we ever received. Scientists from far and near tried to solve it. It remained an unknown. The men who made the original sighting stuck by the case and furnished the more detailed objective observational data the Air Force speaks of. The mysterious lights appeared again, and instead of looking for something high in the air, they looked for something low and found the solution. The world-famous Lubbock lights were night-flying moths reflecting the bluish-green light of a nearby row of mercury-vapor streetlights. I will go a step further than the Air Force, however, and quote from a letter from ex-Lieutenant Andy Flues, once an investigator for Project Blue Book. Flues's statement sums up my beliefs and, I'm quite sure, the beliefs of everyone who has ever worked on Project's sign, grudge, or blue book. Flues wrote, 
Even taking into consideration the highly qualified backgrounds of some of the people who made sightings, there was not one single case which, upon the closest analysis, could not be logically explained in terms of some common object or phenomenon. The only reason there are any unknowns in the UFO files is that an effort is made to be scientific in making evaluations. And being scientific doesn't allow for any educated assuming of missing data or the passing of judgment on the character of the observer. However, this is closely akin to being forced to follow the Marquis of Queensbury rules in a fight with a hood. The investigation of any UFO sighting is an inexact science at the very best. Any UFO investigator, after a few months of being steeped in UFO lore and allowed a few scientific rabbit punches, can make the best of the unknowns look like a piece of well-holed Swiss cheese. But regardless of what I say, or what the Air Force says, or what anyone says, we are stuck with flying saucers. And as long as people report unidentified objects in the air, it's the Air Force's responsibility to explain them. Project Blue Book will live on. No responsible scientist will argue with the fact that other solar systems may be inhabited, and that some day we may meet those people. But it hasn't happened yet, and until that day comes, we're stuck with our space-age myth, the UFO. End of chapter 20 Recording by Roger Moline End of The Report on Unidentified Flying Objects by Edward Ruppelt